All right. I just, welcome to everyone. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about Mary. Mary Spencer has been a culinary instructor for over 20 years. Her professional cooking career began when she donated charitable auction dinners and cooking classes to the downtown Detroit YMCA and, and the Northville Parks and Recreation. These dinners were a tremendous success and encouraged Mary to become <clears throat> A professional culinary instructor by way of background mary learned to cook from attending some 200 cooking seminars from acclaimed chefs including jacques pepin milos chicla nicholas malgiri she has taught cooking classes at a number of metro detroit cooking equipment stores including kitchen glamour kitchen witch scotty's kitchen and abc warehouse she is presently the owner of taste a cook's place llc a cooking school and cooks Resource Center situated in Plymouth, Michigan. Mary has also conducted numerous classes for corporations, service organizations, and individuals. She has been a guest lecturer at the U of M Sociology Department and Michigan State University. Her class repertoire includes over a thousand class tested cooking presentations covering a wide range of topics. Her personal library holds over 5,500 cookbooks. <laughs> My own library. Welcome Mary. And I wanted to let everybody know just so you can make a note. On June 20th, Mary's going to come again, and she's going to talk about summer air fry meals. So welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us. Uh, so tonight, we're going to be doing some Mexican food. And I wanted to do something that was a little bit summery, maybe uh, something that you guys could whip up real quick. Cinco de Mayo is coming up real soon. So it's a good opportunity to uh, do some uh, real, you know, it's not, this isn't complicated. I think it just has a lot of flavor. And I think that when you start focusing on flavor, especially with Mexican food, it just, you know, it, it, that's where the whole um, secret lies. So we're going to do two recipes. I'm going to do an air fryer chicken um, stuffed, uh, a fajita stuffed chicken breast. I'm using the air fryer just because it's going to take me a lot less time to cook it as opposed to doing it in the oven. So, but I'll tell you how to do it in your oven. It's not an issue um, if you don't have an air fryer. And then we are going to do some uh, shrimp tostadas with an avocado salsa. So just really easy. I love doing something a little more unique. Um, you can do things that are these as kind of an appetizer if you wanted to. So we're going to start off with our uh, fajita chicken. So I have some chicken breast here. And um, I'm going to show you guys how to make a pocket in the chicken breast. When I buy them, I always buy chicken breast fresh. I just feel like, you know, um, it's just a better product. I, you know, I, I don't like it when things kind of come out and they're freezer burned or they're a lot less juicy. So I'm gonna do the chicken breast. I've, always, I've already trimmed them. Um, so if there's any kind of sinew or fattiness on them, you wanna trim them and make sure that you have all of that removed. I'm going to just cut a little pocket and make sure that you have a nice sharp knife. Always want to put your hand on the chicken breast so that you stabilize it. And then with the tip of your nice knife, I just kind of cut through and kind of keeping my knife at a parallel level with the cutting board. Okay. Because I don't want the, um, I don't want to cut through the top of the skin or through the bottom. So always remember that you kind of keep it parallel. I'm going to cut right through to the back of the chicken breast and I kind of can feel where my knife is cutting and I'm just going to kind of slice through so I have that nice pocket that you guys can see okay. So what I'm going to do is I have another one here that I cut earlier and I, you know I'm not I, this is very very easy recipe I don't have to worry about you know you actually um what um what was I going to say make making sure that things aren't going to fall out because this is going to be very 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 um laid back I'm going to season the inside of my chicken I'm also going to season the top of it okay with uh, salt and pepper so kosher salt on, on the chicken I'm going to use a little bit of cracked black pepper as well um, you know, you want your you want it to taste really good. You want it to be really well seasoned because you're going to be roasting this, and your vegetables, you know, are are going to are kind of they're kind of going to roast in with the chicken breast as well. So I have one that I've already done. I'm going to remove these to the um, my sheet pan. We're going to get rid of this little plastic cutting board, and then I have some. Um, this is just very thinly sliced peppers and a uh, red onion, really thinly sliced. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna take these and we're gonna pop them right into the middle of our chicken. I don't have any oil in this or anything. Um, and if you guys have questions, you know, just go ahead and ask. Um, Denise will, uh, you know, just let me know and then we can add, answer your questions, you know, as they come through. So don't, don't hesitate to ask. I'm gonna put as much as I can in here. These, these vegetables will actually cook down a bit. So we'll throw them in here. I mean, if you're really paranoid about it, you could, you could secure them with a toothpick, but you really, really don't have to. They're gonna stay intact. If they fall out a little bit, it's not a big issue. All right, so I'm gonna throw as many of these vegetables in here as I can. Now, if you've got a single drawer um, air fryer, you can only do two at a time, obviously, because they're a small compartment. I have a double drawer, so I could do three if I wanted to, but I'll save the, the last one for later on. We'll, we'll go ahead and do that later. I'm gonna wash my hands. Um, chicken. chicken is not something that you wanna keep on your hands, your chicken juices, you wanna make sure that you, you know, you clean everything. That's why I keep the plastic board for the chicken and then my uh, composite board is for everything else. So that's kind of how I like to operate. So when I'm air frying, I could do these in the oven. I could throw these right on a sheet pan. We're gonna make a little rub to go on top of this. And then we're gonna spread the whole chicken breast with the rub. And then we could pop them in the oven at a, a 400 degree oven. I would set my oven at 400, let it preheat. Uh, get a little bit of oil on, on top of the chicken breast. Pop them in your oven for about, I'd say maybe, oh, 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes, something like that. When they get nice and brown and the vegetables get nice and cooked on the inside, that you should be good to go. Um, so I'm going to do I'm going to do it in the air fryer, which will take a lot less time. And we're going to make a little rub. And I have here a little bit of ground cumin. I have some chili powder, and I have a little bit of garlic powder. I've already put my seasoning on my chicken breast. I like to do that instead of adding it to the rub. Because sometimes, um, you're, even if a recipe says to add a teaspoon of salt to your rub, it might not be enough. I mean, if you, you, I like to evenly season my chicken breast. That way, the whole thing is going to be well seasoned and it's going to taste really good. So that might be just me. I don't know. But I, I, I tend to season all my food first and then add my rub later. So to the, to the rub, I'm going to add a little bit of olive oil, enough so that this will become kind of a paste when I stir it. So just basically stir that around and this has become a paste almost, you know, almost immediately. I'm gonna add just a little bit more olive oil. You can do vegetable oil, you can do canola oil, whatever you really want. Now I am using ancho chili powder. When I say chili powder, um, everybody kind of automatically thinks about chili powder that you get and put in your chili. I tend to like to use chili powder that is made from dried chili peppers that is dried and then ground up and, you know, roasted and then ground. I just think it has a lot more flavor than just like your chili powders that you get. Typically a uh, chili powder that you buy from a grocery store that's all blended with other spices. It could have maybe some coriander in it. It could have cumin in it. Um, and typically it's going to be made with cayenne pepper, which is a little bit of a spicier pepper. So I like the, the chili pepper that I like is a, um, is an ancho chili pop, uh, pepper. So if you've ever seen a ancho, um, it's it, um, a poblano pepper, which is, looks like a green pepper. It's about this big and it has a pointed tip on it. So a little bit more of an emerald green color than a green pepper. And as far as how much heat it has, if you look at the heat index in peppers, the green pepper is going to be right at the bottom. There's no heat in a green pepper. You get a little bit up to the top or right above a green pepper would be a poblano pepper. So it's got just a tiny bit of heat, not enough to kind of make you run for a glass of water, but it will be a little tiny, just a tiny bit. When they dry it and then they roast it and then they pulverize it, they call it an ancho chili. So ancho chili powder is something that you can buy in the grocery store. Um, a lot of grocery stores sell them right now. So you're going to be very little bit of heat, um, much more uh, flavor forward. It's going to be a lot of flavor. There's other chili uh, powders that you could use. So you could use a chipotle, which would be 
um, what they call, a, what, what you call a jalapeno would be a chipotle uh, powder. Uh, you could do guajillo, which is a little bit spicier than a, um, than a poblano. I seem to always stick with the ancho just because it has an awful lot of flavor and it doesn't have as much heat. So, you know, if I'm serving it to people who don't like that enormous amount of heat in their chilies, um, you know, it just goes a little bit better. So I'm going to add my, um, I'm going to add my, uh, my, a little bit more olive oil to make it more of a paste. And we're going to spread this right on top of my chicken breast, just like that. Okay. So I like to do that. You know, you can do it ahead, let it kind of sit, let it marinate a little bit if you wanted to, but it really isn't necessary. It's not going to really pick up a lot of flavor. It's going to be, you know, however, I'm going to season this last one just just so that I can say that I did before I lose the rest of this rub. So before somebody throws it out on me. So we're gonna do the same thing here. All right, so just a lot of flavor. I tend to like a little more cumin. So, you know, for me, I add more cumin to it, but you don't have to. You, you <laughs> have to cook the way that you like to cook. If you don't like a lot of one spice, decrease the amount. If you like a little bit more of another spice, add, add a little bit more. It's really totally up to you. So if I was doing it in the oven, I would maybe oil my sheet pan a little bit with some olive oil, some canola oil, whatever you want to do. I'm going to do it in the air fryer. Okay, so I've got the air fryer basket, and I'm going to use a little bit of Pam. And the reason being, I don't want it to, it's not going to stick, but I just want it to, um, and I'm going to spray just the top a little bit with the uh, Pam because in an air fryer, you still need a little bit of oil. I mean, it's, I, I think that if people think in an air fryer, you don't need any. We'll talk about uh, air frying a lot more when we do our June demo, but um, in an air fryer, you still just need a little bit so things don't stick and so forth. Now, because I'm putting this directly on the, sh on the grate, I'm also going to add just a little bit of water because this comes out that we're going to cook it on this rack. And this comes out and I'm going to put a little bit of water in the bottom so that any juices that tend to drip won't burn. OK, it's not going to do anything to the flavor, but I'm just going to add a drop of water to the bottom of my pan so things don't uh, burn. And, you know, you're gonna start, you start seeing smoke and you panic and it's not a good thing. So I'm going to spray this just a little bit. This is nonstick, so I don't have to do a lot. And then I'm going to take these chicken breasts that I've already rubbed and we're going to put one on one side and the other on the other side. So you guys kind of see what I've got going on there. And uh, we're going to put these in the air fryer for probably, I'm going to put these off to the side. Wash my hand a little bit. And um, so we're going to set the air fryer for about six minutes to begin with. And what's going to happen after that six minutes, I'm going to add some cheese to the top of that. And then I'm going to cook it for another six minutes. So in an air fryer, a chicken breast boneless with a bone, it would take longer, but boneless, it will take probably 12 minutes, 12 to 13 minutes. And the way that we're going to tell if they're done is with an instant read thermometer. You, the, the only way, unless you are a seasoned chef, who, you know, can poke their food and tell the doneness, uh, a thermometer is the best way. So um, I am going to set air fry on this. We're going to set our temperature at 375. And I'm going to do six minutes on this. And we're going to hit go. So this is cooking for six minutes. Once this cooks six minutes, the timer will go off. We'll, we'll revisit our chicken breast, okay? So if you have any questions, please let me know. In the oven, you're going to cook, you're going to cook this for probably... I would say I would give it at least 13 or 14 minutes in the oven, take it out, add your cheese to the top of it, and then um, and then about maybe three minutes after that, when the cheese melts, your chicken breast should be done. But again, even in the oven, you want to make sure that you check the temperature with a thermometer. Temperature of done chicken should be at least 160 to 165, okay? So, uh, you know, that's... Um, Nothing should be less than 160 when it comes to chicken, especially, all right? So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to work on our shrimp tostadas. Really, really easy. I'm going to start with a little bit of kind of like a black bean spread that we're going to do on our um, for our tostadas. 
And what is a tostada? A tostada is essentially a flat tortilla that's been deep fried. Okay, so it just looks, it's, it looks flat, it's made of corn. And what we're gonna do is put our toppings on here and that would be something that you would serve and people could cut it and eat it. And it, it's, a, it's a finger food, it's a fork food, whatever, however you want it to be. Kind of really informal. These are great for summer, for picnics or whatever. This is a really nice little um, dish. It could be served as an appetizer if you wanted it to. It wouldn't have to be just as an entree. So I'm going to take, I've got a can of black beans that I uh, split it in half and I've got half of the can in my bowl and I'm just going to take a fork and I'm just going to mash those beans in my bowl with a fork. We're going to kind of make a um, kind of like a little uh, spread. Okay, so I, I've got my fork. I'm going to, I've rinsed my beans and I've drained them. So if you're using canned beans, you want to rinse and you want to drain them because you don't want that kind of... Um, starchy liquid to stay on your beans, especially if you're doing this to them, okay? So now I have kind of almost like what you would consider like almost a refried bean look to this. They're kind of pasty at this point, like a spread, okay? And that's kind of what I'm looking for here. I am gonna add some seasoning to this. I am gonna add, um, I have some, fresh my memory. I have a little bit of ground cumin. I have some uh, blackened seasoning, which is, uh, kind of a um, seasoning that has some paprika in it, it has some cumin in it, a little bit of cayenne pepper, a little coriander, some garlic powder, kind of a seasoning blend. If you don't have blackened seasoning, don't um, go out and buy some. You really don't need to. I'm sure everybody has some kind of a seasoned salt at home, something that has more than just salt in it. Maybe like even a Lawry's would work or... Um, you know, there's many, many different kinds of seasoning salts out there. Um, I probably have like five or six in my pantry. And, you know, I, I use them whenever I want something a little bit different. But blackened seasoning works really nice because it has that really, you know, it has a little bit of a um, smokiness. And I think there's a little smoked paprika in it. And it also has a little bit of heat to it, too. So that's kind of why I like it for what we're cooking. But you don't have to go out and buy it. So I'm going to add my... Season my blackened seasoning. I've got some lime juice we're going to throw in here. All right, and get some lime juice. Um, when you are cutting a lime or juicing a lime, roll the lime by the with the palm of your hand on your counter first, and you're going to get a lot more juice out of it because you can break the cells of the of the lime. These are kind of small limes, so I'm going to add more than one here, a little bit more. I like that lime taste, like, you know, and I always use fresh citrus. I really have a hard time with um, that stuff in the plastic bottle. To me, it just has this unnatural flavor to it. But if that's all you can get your hands on, you know, by all means, I'm not saying don't use it. But if you can get fresh limes, you can freeze lime juice. You know, if your limes are going bad on you and you want to get rid of them juice them all and freeze the juice in ice cube trays and then you have it for when you need it. Um, but I like to buy like lemons and limes on sale. And that way I get, you know, I can have all that um, at my fingertips when I need it. So it's really, really good. I'm going to take a little bit of uh, avocado. So when you're, when you're cutting an avocado or when you're picking an avocado, you want to look at that little stem that's attached to the back end of the avocado. If it's brown, it should be a good, nice and uh, ripe avocado. You can actually take out that stem and look at it, and it should be brown in there. If it's green on the inside, it's going to be a little bit unripe. So um, it, if it's brown but not, like, blackened, because if it's black, it might be overripe. So there's a fine line. You just have to look at it. And the other way that you can tell is just by giving a light squeeze pressure of your fingers should be able to indent the skin of the avocado. And that, you know, that works really well too. So when I'm cutting open an avocado, I always cut it open like this. Okay. Right around the circumference. And then you take it, you twist it, and then you you know, your avocado is ready to go. To get the pit out of the avocado, I always put it on a towel and I take my knife and I just kind of put it in the avocado and hit it. And then it sticks to my knife but always put it on a towel. I was doing a cooking class one time and I don't mean to scare you guys, but 
was doing a cooking class one time and um, a lady told me that she had an avocado. And, you know, honestly, with these things, even if you do the pressure test on the avocado or you do, um, you know, you uh, uh, you look at the, 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 the uh, blossom end and it's it's, you know, brown, it could still be way past its prime. So I guess the one that she had was so when she put the knife in it, the knife went through the avocado and hit her hand. And she said, I, she ended up in the hospital and it wasn't a good thing. So now I've learned my lesson. I always put a towel just so that it breaks that blow of the knife if you can. So I'm going to show you how to, what basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a for, a knife and we're just going to score it one way and we're going to score it the opposite way. So I get these nice cubes. Okay. Just like this. And then I'm going to take a spoon and we're just going to go around the inside rim of the avocado and just pull that right out so that it's all chopped, ready to go. Okay, so you don't even have to um, you don't even have to put it on a cutting board, which is nice because avocados can get kind of mushy and make a mess if you really don't watch them. So you know it's always a good thing. All right, so there's our avocado, and I want to make sure I have everything here. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and. Um, mash it again with that avocado in here. Now, one of the things people always ask is how do you keep your avocado from turning brown or your guacamole from turning brown? Part of the problem is that they, these are vegetables that oxidize very quickly, meaning when they hit air, they, watch turn, TV? they turn brown and it, it, it just is not, you know, it's, it just doesn't look pretty. It's going to taste good. It watch the TV. So I always, if I'm making guacamole, what I tend to do is I tend to take a little bit of um, uh, lemon juice or I mean olive oil. And once I pack the um, guacamole in my container, whatever it is, I'm going to refrigerate it in. I add a little bit of olive oil to the top of the guacamole and cover it and then put the lid on and that will keep it from oxidizing because now you've sealed it away from air. So if you're looking for a way to, um, you know, keep it from turning brown, that's a really good way to do it. I'm going to season this with a little salt, a little pepper, and I'm going to throw just a little bit of olive oil in here to kind of give it more of a little bit of a moist, moist look to it. Okay. So we have our little, like our, it's almost like a guacamole here, to, to be honest with you. So I'm just going to leave this off to the side. Oh, before I do that, I'm going to add the rest of my beans in here. The ones that I did not mash from the can. So when you open the can of beans and you rinse them and drain them, you want to add some uh, to the bowl and mash. And the rest of them you're going to add when you're done. So you have um, beans, you know, whole beans left in the, in the container. So... Now my chicken is um, actually done at this point, or midway done, which is good. We are going to take it out of the air fryer and take a look at it. It's starting to brown a little bit. It's looking really, really nice. I hope you guys can see that. I have some cheddar cheese. You can add any kind of cheese you want. If you want pepper jack, if you like the heat, add some pepper jack cheese to this. I'm going to add maybe two pieces of cheese to this. Whoops. Little papers. Now, because I am doing this in the air fryer, what you want to make sure that you do, um, what I'm going to do is cut this in half because I can add half of this. Okay, so that'll cover the whole chicken breast. So what I'm going to do is I am going to secure the, if you're doing this in the air fryer, you need to secure the cheese with a toothpick because cheese is light. If you put it in the air fryer and you don't secure it to your chicken, what could happen is it could lift because of the fan in the air fryer and it'll go up into the heating element and then you're going to have a mess. So the best thing to do is just take a toothpick, secure your cheese. So I've got two pieces here. We'll secure two pieces of cheese. All right. And then again, same thing. All right. So now I have my cheese on my chicken breast, real simple. And I can tell that my vegetables are cooking because I can smell them. They smell really good. We're going to give this another, I'm going to say we're going to do eight minutes, okay? So we're, got our, um, we're going to air fry 375 again, and I'm going to set this for eight minutes. Again, if you're doing it in the oven, take them out about, um, I'd say, three minutes before you think they're done. 
put your cheese on top and throw it back in the oven so that you can um, finish them that way. Okay, so that works. So for our shrimp, I am going to do a little salsa in addition to our uh, little bean spread. This is going to go on top of our, as a garnish on top of our shrimp. So I have some, uh, this is finely chopped red onion. And then I also have a little bit of uh, orange. This is an orange that I've, uh, I've finely chopped as well. So just into small dice, peeled it, and then I diced it. No big deal. If you're not a fan of onion served raw, and a lot of people don't like that taste of onion when it's like that raw flavor. What you can do is actually, um, when you've chopped your onion, put it in a little sieve, run it really quickly under cold running water, just under your tap, and then um, drain it, let it drain. That will remove some of that sulfuric taste of an onion. It won't do anything else to the onion. It will just remove some of that harsh flavor. And then, uh, you know, it'll be a little bit more palatable to you if you're not a fan of raw onion. So um, I found that that works really well for people who don't like that taste of the raw onion. So I have a jalapeno here. I'm gonna add a little bit of heat to this um, just because you know it is Mexican food and peppers are you know kind of uh, a good thing. Jalapenos are probably like in the middle of the heat index. So they're gonna be a little spicy. A serrano, you could interchange a serrano with a jalapeno. Serrano is a little thinner, it's a little pointier. And it is a little spicier than a jalapeno. So if you're not a fan of really, really hot, jalapeno is a safe bet. You could do a poblano as well. Adds a little bit of heat and adds a little bit of flavor too. So that's a good thing. Um, it is your choice completely if you want to um, add the seeds or not. I don't like to add the seeds. I don't like the crunch the seeds give. I just like to um, you know, add the, the actual pepper. So for this amount of salsa, I think half of a pepper is good. So I remove the ribs and I remove the seeds. I just, I'm not a fan. Um, and plus my heat tolerance is about mid-level. I'm not a huge um, heat lover as far as hot foods is concerned. So I'm gonna just take that jalapeno and we're gonna slice it into strips. And then we're just gonna slice it into small pieces, okay? So real simple, just like this. Just cut it into small pieces. I should use a bigger knife, but you know, this will do so real quick. All right, so we're going to toss this. You, you can eliminate the jalapeno. You don't have to add it. Uh, make sure that when you're cutting hot peppers, you do not touch your eyes. Don't touch your don't touch your face. You know, it's not a good thing. Um, when I was really young and I had just started cooking, I decided I was going to pickle a whole bushel of hot yellow peppers. And I didn't realize how actually hot they were. And so after I was done with them and I did not wear gloves because I was not, I was dumb. I was young and dumb at the time, to be honest. My hands burned so bad. I did not know what to do with my, myself. And honestly, the, the internet was not there. So I couldn't figure out how to get them to stop. But the way, if you've touched them and you, you have a sensation of burning on your fingers, milk, sour cream is the best. Just Get a little sour cream, rub it on your fingers and let it just sit. It'll take the burn away. It's the fat and the milk and the sour cream that, that helps. So it's, it's a great solution to that. So there is my uh, salsa. I'm going to add a little bit of my, um, my other half of my, um, uh, my avocado. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm concentrating. I don't want to cut myself. And we're just going to remove this again, just like this. Okay, throw those in. When, I, when I'm cooking with uh, like a Mexican food, I like to use some of the indigenous vegetables. When I'm talking about indigenous, I'm talking about peppers. For me, you know, I think that makes a big difference when you have some really tasty peppers and, and things like that in your food. It really makes it taste more Mexican. Um, and as well, like the ancho pepper powder, the, the chili powders, it really makes a difference. I'm adding some fresh lime juice to this. If you're not gonna use this right away, you wanna refrigerate it just so it stays fresh. All right, so I'm another, I like a lot of lime juice, guys, that's just me. I like that flavor. All right, and I think I'm good. I got the jalapeno. I'm going to add a little cilantro to this. So let's add, let's cut up a little cilantro because we'll use some of that for our chicken as well. So I have some cilantro. Um, 
If you're not a cilantro lover, skip it. It's, it's fine. You don't really have to add it if you don't want to. There are some people who really are genetically disposed to not liking cilantro. It's a proven thing that they, it's in their genes that cilantro tastes soapy to them. So I get it. You know, if you don't like it, don't add it. It's totally up to you. And I have my cilantro. I wash it. I always put it in uh, paper towels. And I am going to, uh, when, I, when I cut cilantro, because it is very tender, it's not like parsley where the stems, where they're attached to the leaves are tough. I use the stems so they're, you know, it's perfectly usable. I'm going to just cut what I think I need off the top, which is right there. And then we'll cut some of that. We'll just chop it. And, you know, I'm not into like chopping really, really small. I just kind of want to make sure that it has a little bit of texture to it. Again, don't use it if you don't want to. Um, I just think it kind of adds that authentic Mexican flavor. It's really, really a delicious um, herb. It kind of gives it that freshness. So I'm going to add a little bit to my salsa. And then I have a little bowl. We'll throw some on our chicken when it's done as well. All right, so we have that all nice and cut. One of the things that I like to do when I'm cooking this kind of food is I really, really like to um, make sure that when I'm cooking this, I like to have everything chopped up and ready to go before I even start cooking. A lot of times, you know, you're cooking something and it's time sensitive and then you're out looking in your pantry for a spice or something to that effect. So for me, I like to have everything chopped and ready to go. And that way I don't have to be looking for things and I have them all set and ready to go, okay? Adding a little salt to this. So this salsa will go in the fridge if I'm not using it right away, but we're gonna use it pretty quickly once the tostadas come out. So there is my, my salsa, we'll put that aside real quick. And I am going to, um, Take my shrimp at this point, cut my, clean my cutting board a little. And my shrimp, when I thaw them, um, and I always buy frozen shrimp because here in Michigan, most of the shrimp you're going to buy are frozen. Unless you live down on the Gulf, um, you know, you, it's very difficult to get fresh shrimp. And here it's mostly frozen. So I prefer to buy it frozen because those shrimp that are sitting in the uh, fishmonger's case, those could be, have been thawed two days ago before, you know, they, before they sell it. And I don't want to buy something that's been out there for a long time. So I buy them frozen. I bring them home. And then I thaw them, in, you know, in a bowl of cold water. I just dump what I need in a bowl of cold water, thaw them, and they're good to go. Now, because I'm going to saute them, I want to make sure they're pretty dry. So after I thaw them, I always put them on a piece of paper towel. And I let them kind of uh, whisk away that moisture and get that... Um, get that, you know, gone so that when I add them to my saute pan, they don't stew in the saute pan. They actually saute. Okay. So our chicken, oh my God, guys, it is so delicious looking. Look at that. Che cheese has melted. I hope you guys can see that. I'm trying to aim it. So you see that it is beautiful. So we'll go, we'll get to that later. We'll plate it and we'll garnish it. I am going to take a little bit of salt, put our salt on our shrimp. All right, and then we're gonna add a little bit of pepper. Oh, actually before, and I'm not gonna add pepper, I'm gonna add that blackening seasoning. We're just gonna put a little bit on there, sprinkle that. It's gonna give it a lot of flavor. Again, seasoned salt, if you don't have blackened seasoning, you're, you're good to go. Just, you know, either one works. All right, so now at this point, I have my saute pan ready to go. Um, I am gonna get my pan hot. And I am gonna add oil to a hot pan. Sauteing something, you always wanna make sure your pan is hot. You add oil to a hot pan and things don't stick. When I'm cooking seafood, typically I like to cook it um, on a nonstick pan just to save my sanity, um, you know, to try to clean something. A lot of times if it does stick, you know, it's an, in a, in a uh, uh, nonstick pan, it's gonna make your life a little easier. So I have my oil here. Once that pan starts getting a little hot, we'll add some oil to the pan, just like that. And I cover the whole bottom of the pan with oil because you're gonna put all that shrimp in there. You wanna make sure you get enough oil in there. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and I'm gonna toss these. 
so that both sides of the shrimp are coated in that seasoning blend that we have. All right, so we'll add our shrimp to this. And literally shrimp takes like two minutes, maybe a minute on each side, depending on the size of your shrimp. These are not huge shrimp. These are probably mid-sized medium shrimp, which uh, you know typically would mean they'd be about uh, 30 to 36 shrimp per pound. In, in a pound of shrimp, which is, you know, a nice, they're a nice size for what we're doing here. To be honest with you, I don't think I'd get them bigger because then you're going to have, you know, these are nice one bite kind of shrimp. If you have them a little bit bigger, they're just going to be a little too overwhelming for you. Okay. So I am going to uh, just let these saute. And when I saute shrimp, I want to make sure that I am here watching them first. And then secondly, I want to make sure that when I cook them, we're going to flip them over because both sides should get browned a little bit. And they're not going to brown like really brown. They're going to just have that tinge of like a little bit of like caramelization on it, which is what I want. Okay. So we're going to let them cook on one side. So literally turn them over at this point. I'm going to turn them all over. And once I've turned them over, I probably can remove them. So when you've cooked shrimp from raw, all right, you want to make sure that they don't become the letter O. Now these are, and I'll just tell you in just a second what I mean by that. But basically, I want to get them all flipped over. You don't want that muscle to contract so much when you cook it that it becomes a circle. That is an overcooked shrimp. You still want to be able to see that little hole in the middle of the shrimp. And typically, it would make a letter C and not a letter O. Okay, so that's kind of what you want um, to happen. By the time I've done that, these shrimp are done. Okay, so you guys can see what I'm talking about. I'm trying to show you without my tongs in the way. But I have a letter C and not a letter O. Okay, I want to make sure that that's the way it is because there, to me, there's nothing worse in the world than overcooked shrimp. They're like little chewy gumballs uh, of seafood, and that's not a fun thing to be, okay? So I have sauteed these. We'll saute a few more just to show you guys what I'm talking about. So, you you know, when you're sauteing something, you get everything in the pan. You don't want food to touch when you saute it. You don't want, you know, your um, shrimp to touch each other, and not because, you know, you're um, kind of finicky about that, but because food, when it touches in a pan, if there's any moisture in that food, it has nowhere to go and it's gonna go be released in the pan and it's going to have um, kind of steam in there instead of, um, instead of saute. So you wanna make sure that you leave plenty of room between, um, between the shrimp, okay, before you, um, when, you, when you're gonna go ahead and saute it, um, like I have here. And I'm gonna to try to show you guys what I'm talking about. So you wanna make sure that there's plenty of room in between all the shrimp. So literally, I put these in a minute ago. By the time I put them all in, it's time to flip them. And, um, you know, you, again, when I see that, if you see, if you look at one, and I don't know if you guys can see this, but you see the back side of it, it still looks kind of, looks raw, and it looks um, kind of see-through. If I flip it over on the other side that's already cooked, it looks opaque and pink. That's what you want. You want that opaque and pink look, okay? So we'll flip them over. It, you know, this should be a very, very relatively easy thing to do. And honestly, guys, if you're doing this, um, you know, um, I usually cook a little more than I need. That way, you know, I, I dirty the pan. I might as well have a few extra later on. It, it's all good. And shrimp lasts in the refrigerator. You can, you know, you can um, use them for other things or just eat them out of hand. I love shrimp. So that's kind of what I do. But there is my shrimp already cooked. Already all set to go. Okay, so before we take our um, chicken out to show you how to finish it, I am gonna show you guys how to um, make sure everything is off. I'm gonna show you how to do these. Mary? Yes. Um, Retta is asking, do you have a good source for shrimp with tails off and deveined? Uh, it, it is, well, and actually these are tails off and I just realized that. I, I usually check them, but I, when I, when I thawed them, I realized I didn't have tails on them. Um, my favorite shrimp are at Costco. And that's the ones that I really, I always seem to love to go there and buy those. 
But lately, um, I've been buying them at Kroger, and this is where I got these from, and they are absolutely delicious. They're really crispy once you've cooked them, uh, shelled, deveined. The problem is they're going to be a little more expensive if they're shelled and deveined. Shelling shrimp is not a fun thing, guys. I, I used to, when I started cooking many years ago, they didn't shell, they didn't sell shrimp that was shelled and deveined. You had to do it yourself. One pound of shrimp can take about 45 minutes to shell and devein. It's a lot of work and it's, it takes time, you know, especially if you're not, you know, real good at it. Um, but buy them shelled and deveined. And if you're, if you buy them with the tail on, but they're shelled and deveined, once they thaw, you can just hold on to the shrimp and take that tail and lightly pull it. It'll come right off. And it, it that takes a, a second. So I prefer to buy them shelled and deveined it, with the tail on than having to shell and vein the whole thing. So it works a little bit better that way, okay? So I have my little spread that we have here. We're gonna put this right on the bottom of our tostada shell. You can get these tostada shells um, if you have a Mexican market around, um, or if you have, um, uh, I got these at Kroger actually. Um, I think Myers would sell them. They sell them right where you buy, you know, find tortillas. So you have, you know, cup, any place I think now sells them. And I'll be perfectly honest with you guys. I, I buy these in place of tortilla chips because they're a little more, they're a little more brown and they're a little more crunchy and they're delicious served with just with salsa. So if you can, you know, if you get a, if you get some of these, try them and you'll see what I mean. They're really, really good just the way they are. Okay. So I have my, um, my uh, uh, base on here. I'm going to add my a little bit of um, Mexican blend cheese. Uh, you can just use cheddar if you don't want to buy a Mexican blend. I'm just going to put this on here, okay? Um, you can do, um, you know, a queso. I'm not a queso, but a, a, like a chihuahua cheese. And what's really interesting, when we were kids, my mother used to always buy monster cheese. And we loved it because we, we used to call it squeaky cheese because you'd eat it and it would squeak in your mouth kind of. It was like that. I don't know what it was about it, but it kind of squeaked a little bit. So we would always buy Munster cheese. If you go to a really authentic Mexican um, market, a lot of times they sell chunks of Munster cheese as their grating cheese for melting because it melts beautifully and it has a really nice mild flavor. So if you don't want to use this and you can, you know, get a block of Munster and just shred it yourself, that works too. Okay. So there is my tostada shells. We're going to pop these in an oven. Oven is at... Um, um, I'd say it's about 375. We're going to let that um, cook for about four minutes, get the cheese nice and melted. And then um, we will take those out and we will uh, finish the tostadas. In the meantime, I want to show you guys how to finish this chicken. So I have these beautiful chicken breasts here. We get the shrimp guys tongs away and we'll take our, oh my gosh, this is so crispy and it's cheese is melty and gooey. I am going to throw, take my toothpicks out. Okay. So there is my fajitas and you can see the vegetables are tender, you know, and, and it'll happen to, if you cut them small enough, you, the trick is to cut them thin enough. If you don't cut them thin enough, they're not going to, um, they're not going to uh, cook in time because, you know, they have to be pretty thin in order to, to cook right. Okay. So I'm going to take my toothpicks out of this one. I put a little bit of, let me remember what I'm going to do here. I'm going to put a little bit of sour cream on the top. So just a touch of sour cream works. All right. And a little bit of, um, just like that, a little bit of cilantro on top of that. And maybe on the side, a touch of guacamole. Okay, and I just bought prepared guacamole. You know, sometimes you don't have to worry about, you know, making everything from scratch if you have a good brand that you can rely on from the store. Um, and I, I just tried this and it's really delicious. And I got this from Kroger. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty decent brand. And then I have some beautiful salsa here too. You can either top it, but I, I like that cheese to be nice and crispy. So I don't like to ruin the crispiness of the cheese. So that's kind of where I'm at on that. So there's my salsa. So there is my um, fajita chicken. Super easy, guys. You saw how simple that was. And if you wanted to, you want to make this in the morning, like, you know, just prepare it so it's ready to go in your oven or in the fryer. 
get it done in the morning. You don't have to worry about it. And then uh, put it in the fridge. When your guests come, pop it in your oven and you're good to go. Okay, that's a, you know, a little side of rice maybe. Maybe if you have some refried beans or something, that would work too. So you, you know, you have a lot of options, but the cheese is nice and crispy and it's really delicious. So there is my fajita chicken. I am going to take a look at my, my uh, tostadas, but they're almost ready to go as well. I have my salsa here. Again, you know, you don't have to make the salsa if you don't want to. The citrus really is nice in the summer. Um, you know, and I, I just added, I had some cara cara oranges, which are a little bit of a uh, deeper orange uh, kind of orange and it has a little bit of a sweeter flavor but it goes really nice in the summer with uh, you know the the balance between the, the shrimp and the the salsa actually and let me see if there's anything else that I'm missing here I don't think so I've got that okay and then if I was going to top the uh, the tostadas I could top them again with a little bit of um, you can put some lettuce on them if you wanted to so once the tostadas come out we're going to show you how to top them but I, you know, if you wanted to, when you're doing it at home, you could throw a little lettuce on. Don't put the lettuce on before you put them in the, when you, you know, before you put them in the oven, because it's going to wilt the lettuce. But lettuce, you could put some diced tomato on it, some diced onion, uh, honestly, whatever you wanted to do. Some sliced jalapenos, like if they're pickled jalapenos, whatever you want. And for all of these dishes, can, you can do the same thing. Those are really delicious, just kind of as an accompaniment to these dishes. All right. So I have my tostadas coming out. And I better take a hot pad because I know myself. It will burn myself if I don't. Okay, so here is my tostadas. We'll move this for one second off to the side. We have my plate here. And I am just going to take these. Let's see if I can do this left handed. I'm going to just put these right on my plate. So these are, you know, vegetarian friendly if, if people. Um, you know, like <laughs> although, you know, you don't have to put the shrimp on these if you don't want, you can do chicken the same way you would saute it the same way or even roast it in the oven. And then you would have, um, you know, your chicken would be ready to go and it would be delicious too. But here is my shrimp on top. All right. So that looks beautiful. Oh my God, that shrimp smells so good. I love shrimp guys. I love it. And you could do fish if you wanted to as well, like some, maybe some tilapia or something, whatever is your favorite. Just, you know, saute it and throw it on top. I think that works. And then we've got our salsa that goes right on top. Uh, kind of fell off to the side, but, you know, you guys get the picture. <laughs> Me and my absolute favorite thing is to be artistic, and I'm not. So I like to cook, guys. But other than that, it's, you know... I like food to taste good. So there you go. There is my, there's my tostadas and there is my chicken. All right. Really easy, great summer um, dishes, great for Cinco de Mayo, you know, whatever, whatever you guys are looking for as far as the Mexican. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, I have done Mexican rice in the oven. An easy way to do Mexican rice, if you're doing it for a crowd, is to just get some long grain rice. Um, throw it in a pan. Like I just use those disposable aluminum pans. If you're, you know, if you want to, you know, do it real, really easy, maybe two cups of rice, depending on how many people you're cooking for. And then I add some of those Rotel tomatoes, like a can of those Rotel tomatoes. And I swish them in, maybe saute some uh, onion, a little bit of garlic, um, and maybe a diced jalapeno, throw that in with the rice and then pour in for my broth. I would pour in some chicken stock and or vegetable stock, depending on who you're feeding. Um, and then cover it, pop it in your oven at 375 for maybe about 40 minutes. And then you have perfectly cooked rice and you fluff it with a fork and it's super easy to do. So it's no work. You know, the last thing people want to be doing is slaving in the kitchen in the summer. Believe me, I know. But, you know, it's um, real simple to do. And I do that for like, you know, for catering and I do that for crowds too, or I do it for just two people because it's a nice way to cook rice without having to watch it on the stovetop. So it's really a good way to do it. So just another idea as far as how to, you know, um, cook the rice really easily. So any other questions or anything, anyone? Any, you guys can unmute yourself if you have something you need to ask Mary. It looks wonderful. I wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to dig in guys. I can't. <laughs> 
It smells so good. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you were here though. I do. <laughs> I wish you could taste. Anybody, any questions? Could you, could you include the recipe for the Mexican rice? I will send it to, I will send it to uh, Denise and she can, um, if she wants to put it on the, uh, sure, we'll put it on the website. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. I'll send thank it you. to her, Denise. Yep. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. It's easy to do. And I love it because again, like I said, I don't have to watch it on the stove. It's just flavorful and it's super easy. Yeah. Yeah. I well, love all your lime and all your little hints. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, I, I like to cook fresh and, you know, for me, I get excited when summer and spring and summer is here because I can use all these fresh things. And that's what I really get, you know, excited about cooking. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it is one of my favorite things to do. And honestly, like limes, lemons, oranges, I never buy bottled. It's always fresh. And I like to use the zest too. So if I, if I wanted to, I could garnish with a little lime zest and, on this and it would really bring out the citrus. <laughs> you know, taste, I mean, beautiful, real, real nice flavors. So, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> All right. Anybody, any questions? I don't, I don't have an air fryer. So I'm wondering if the chicken is kind of crispy. It is. It's, uh, I, I don't know if you can't hear it, but let me, let me cut it open. I can show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, but no, it, it is, um, you know, it's not going to be super crispy. It's going to, the, the cheese actually got a little crispy, but I'm going to show you what the inside looks like. I'm glad you said something because I wanted to show you the inside, but there is the inside of the chicken perfectly done. Yeah. Okay. And I, I can tell, I could tell by the way it felt if I was going to use an instant re thermometer, I would basically, everybody should own an instant re thermometer, by the way. Um, testing meat is that this is the easiest way to do it. This is a fancy one because it's digital, but you can buy one that's very inexpensive and works beautifully. But I would put it in halfway in and this chicken is reading 165 degrees. So that's what you want. You know, you don't want to eat chicken any less than that because it's not, you know, chicken is always served cooked, well cooked guys, you know, not anything less. So absolutely. So yeah, but no, that it's a, the, the cheese makes them a little crispy because it crisps up and you can see that it got a little crispy on the side here, but the chicken is nice and moist and tender. There's no, the moisture is not gone from the chicken whatsoever. All righty. All right. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Anything? Let's see if there's something. Okay. Oh, wait, somebody said, uh, oh, one, somebody asked if you could hold up the chicken again so they could see it. Absolutely. Can you guys see that? Oh, there's a good, yeah. Closer to the camera. That's good. Oh yeah. That looks great. That. Oh, it's so, it smells so good. <laughs> I cannot tell you guys. I mean, it just smells so good. Make sure though, when you make it, cut the vegetables very thin. That way they'll cook along with the chicken. If you cut them too thick, they're going to stay crunchy, you know, and that's not always a really good thing. Yeah. All right. All righty. Okay. All right. Well, if nobody has any other questions, then we'll, we'll say goodbye to Mary and we will see her again in June, but thank you. Thank you.